Good afternoon, friends. I would like to appreciate and thank you for this kind invitation. I wish I was in Bahrain. I've been there a few times. I love uh, the city, especially at this time of the year when it's getting a little cold in Canada. So the topic that was given to me is transient ischemic attacks and minor strokes. My disclosures, I have uh, no disclosures for this presentation. And I will focus on these three things for the 20 minutes that have been allocated. I want to first emphasize and discuss in greater detail that all focal symptoms are not ischemic in nature and that all focal symptoms should not be treated aggressively um, with dual antiplatelets. So we'll spend some time there. Because we, because we need to make a diagnosis, I'll then spend some time on the investigations. And I use the word tempo because you've got to move very fast, especially if the person has presented to you on the day that they had their symptoms. And then of course, end my presentation with some discussion on how best to manage these patients, short term and long term. So um, first of all, transient spells is a much better diagnosis when somebody calls you or first presents in your emergency department. Probably half of them, if not more, are not ischemic in nature. So your first job, if it's in the emergency department or um, in your clinic, is to differentiate between what we call the high-risk DIA, and I'll discuss that with you in the next few slides, and separate them from low-risk TIAs and a whole slew of um, mimics. The reason why it's so important to uh, differentiate them is that in the high-risk TIAs, they're called high-risk TIAs because the risk of stroke is very high in these patients. Some more dated study, this is um, getting to be almost 18 years now from um, Canada, looked at the cumulative risk of stroke in patients who presented with TIAs. And they looked at the first seven days and 20 days and going up to almost 100 days. And they showed that the risk is very high earlier on in the first 48 hours. So if you look at, break these into three phases. By the time you see them in the first seven days, if you haven't, if they haven't come to you by then, then most of them uh, at the highest risk would have already had the stroke, unfortunately. So if they present in the first 24 to 48 hours, you've got to move very fast. If they present to you after that, especially if the first 15, 20 days are gone, then you can be somewhat more relaxed because the high risk patients have already delivered their goods. So the high risk patients then, uh, where does that term come from and how do we um, pick those up? There are multiple ways of looking at them. Um, some of these are based on the symptoms. And the first study that validated that is again, somewhat old now. Um, um, Peter Rothwell and his group from Oxfordshire had presented their work almost 16 years ago, where they looked at the first uh, four weeks, and this is the risk score that they had designed. So the risk score included age of more than 60, presence of hypertension, treated or untreated. Importantly, weakness, it had to be focal weakness and uh, speech disturbance. And then if the duration was more than uh, 60 minutes, they were considered to be high risk. So if you scored them, and if the score was more than three, so four, five, six, you can see as the score increased, the risk of stroke, early stroke increased from almost uh, zero for those who are under four uh, on the score to as high as 11% uh, um, or 20% in the first uh, four weeks. So the score is important. And let me just briefly talk about this so that you can um, keep this in mind. The score has been validated several times. And so the ABCD score is age of more than 60, one point, hypertension, one point, 
Importantly, if they have weakness, that it gives you two points and speech gives you one point. For duration more than 60 minutes, there's two points and diabetes has one. So score of more than four, high risk score than a score of three or less, um, very simple way of uh, defining their risk score. The second thing that's really important to remember is the mechanism, the etiology of what causes these symptoms as important as is time. So if you see them within the first 24 hours, the risk is very high, but if you see them later than that, the risk gradually falls. An interesting um, study from several centers, this is uh, Pierre Emerenko from uh, Paris has led this study, big group of individuals, they first published their data in the New England Medical Journal almost five years ago now, they had a subsequent publication this year also. So they classified their patients into those whose symptoms were less than 24 hours of duration. See, this group has got a much higher risk of stroke compared to those whose symptoms uh, were of more than 24 hour duration. We've talked about the ABCD score. So low score, low risk of early stroke, high score, much higher risk of early stroke. Now, and I'll talk about this a little later also, uh, are these two things. One is the etiology. So if you've got atherosclerosis, uh, especially if you've got critical stenosis of a symptom, the carotid artery on the symptomatic side, very high risk of early stroke. If you've got embolic disease, very high risk of, of stroke. And if you do your investigations and you don't find the etiology, these patients tend to have a much lower risk. So you can see that the risk of stroke can go up from 2% in the first um, year, mostly in the first few days, to as high as 8 to, eight to 9%. Finally, and this is where the investigations become really important, is that if your imaging shows no ischemic strokes, so that's the CT or MR, especially MR, um, and then the risk of recurrence is low. Whereas if you see multiple infarcts, there is a four to six fold higher risk of stroke. So symptoms, when you see the patient, what type of stroke it was and what the imaging show, this helps you classify the highest risk patients from those that are mimics. And mimics usually tend to have symptoms like dizziness and lightheadedness and vertigo can sneak in there, painful symptoms, positive symptoms, all of those are the ones that you need to differentiate. Uh, an, an interesting etiology that sometimes becomes important in individuals who've had a previous history of a stroke is um, this syndrome that was described uh, three or four years ago called recrudescence. It was described in JAMA uh, Neurology by Lee Schwalm and his group from the Mass General Hospital, the term itself is called recrudescence of deficits after acute stroke. It's important to keep in mind because it is not uncommon at all. So somebody's had a previous stroke or an ischemic, uh, ischemic stroke or a hemorrhage, and then weeks to months to even years later, they present with symptoms which are typically milder and mostly motor or, or sensory or can be speech on the side where they'd had a stroke months to years ago. These symptoms are typically seen in patients when they have either an infection or they have a hypertensive episode, they can have electrolyte disturbances or they may be under stress or haven't slept well. So these are the precipitating factors that can bring on these symptoms of the previous stroke, and you gotta recognize this, and it's important to recognize this because these symptoms uh, should not be treated as a new stroke. They're simply re-emergence of the previous symptoms, and as you treat the underlying mechanism, the symptoms improve. The final category of uh, mimics that is important, common in the elderly, is uh, related to cerebral amyloid angiopathy. So these transient symptoms were well described, beautifully put together in Eric Smith's paper that came out this summer in neurology, and I urge you to read them, this, this paper. 
because these symptoms are transient, they're multiple, they happen again and again. They're usually more uh, akin to the migraine aura than a true uh, ischemic uh, TIA. They often spread from one part of the body to another. They're not in a very vascular distribution. And typically, you have multiple symptoms, and then the patient starts getting better. Why is it important to remember? Because dual antiplatelets or anticoagulants may put these individuals at a somewhat higher risk of uh, intracranial hemorrhage. So, big differential diagnosis. How do you investigate them? And the first part of investigation is to find out what's causing the underlying, what's the underlying mechanism. So if you look at the underlying mechanisms, you can, if you see a lesion that's subcortical, these are typically lacunar. If they're cortical, they're typically either embolic from their neck vessels or from their heart, right? So you've got these mechanisms, lacunar for, for uh, subcortical and either cardiomolic or artery to artery emboli for these cortical strokes. But remember that these can occasionally seep into subcortical strokes also. So overall, if you want to look at these mechanisms, um, out of 100 patients with stroke, approximately 88 uh, of percent of them would be ischemic in nature. Of those, 23% would be lacunar, and the vast majority would be non-lacunar cortical strokes. In these, about 30 or 40% would be cardioembolic. About 15 to 20% would be large artery disease. And then they got these big group of patients, which are described, and almost half of them are cryptogenic. In the cryptogenic, um, about half of them may be um, of the cortical nature that are called the is, um, ischemic uh, embolic uh, stroke of unknown etiology. So how do you go about investigating these patients? First of all, the basics are you do a CT scan to rule out a hemorrhage or a tumor or other etiology, and you do some type of vascular imaging that gives you an idea whether they've got critical stenosis in the symptomatic carotid side or not. These are widely available. Our practice, on the other hand, is that we prefer that this MRI be done very frequently in combination to CT angio. So MR gets done in our patient who presented last evening, the MRI would be done the first thing in the morning, and last night they would have already had the CT angio. <clears throat> Excuse me, the CT angio gives you the potential mechanism or you may have distal occlusions and the MR shows you the lesion with it. We also are in the first few days looking for a potential cardioembolic source so we'll do an echocardiogram and we'll do a Holter monitor. Remember the Holter monitor is a little annoying because in 24 hours, it'll only detect 3% of potential atrial fibrillation. So most of us are doing external loop recording, which can give you six weeks in the spiral flash model, or you can do internal loop recorder, which can stay for a year longer and you pick up a much higher incidence of paroxysmal atrial fibrillation in your patients. So MR gives you the mechanism, the cortical diffusion lesion tells you that this is a recent event. And remember I told you earlier that it is important that if you've got a, a lesion or multiple lesions, um, these are the extremely high risk patients, even though the symptoms are fully recovered. MR is interesting. Uh, your MR can show you an infarct um, present in here in the cortex, or it may be absent, but with high resolution MR imaging. So if, if, the, if the MR shows no lesion, it could be a mimic, it could still be a TIA. And if you go to high resolution, you can actually see these lesions, which may have been missed on your clinical MR. Give an example of a patient here that's important. So this patient presented with multiple uh, um, ischemic events and had um, uh, on Doppler imaging 90% stenosis of the ipsilateral, um, uh, of the ipsilateral uh, hemisphere. But when we did an MR, we saw these multiple emboli and multiple viscovascular distributions. It's not uncommon, in fact, to see that you may have multiple etiologies. So carotid stenosis, as well as atrial fibrillations. What do we do in these patients? We treat them 
with um, an endarterectomy and then put them on long-term anticoagulation treatment. So final section, treatment. Treatment is, I mean, you can, you can spend a lot of time on treatment, but in brief, you treat your risk factors. You've got multiple risk factors. The ones that we can treat aggressively are diabetes, smoking, hyperlipidemia, and hypertension. Um, and these carry at least 50% of the risk. I've already discussed that in patients with symptomatic um, carotid stenosis, you do an endarterectomy and the got atrial fibrillation, you treat them. The asymptomatic carotid stenosis is a totally different game that I don't have the time to get into. Our preference is if you manage risk factors and treat it medically. So my first um, point on treatment is be very aggressive in treating your hypertension, bring it down to 140 or 90, or even better if you bring it down to 120 or 70 and expect that you use multiple medications. Secondly, uh, you have to be very aggressive uh, with treating uh, LDL. Your target should be in the high risk patients for 3.5 or lower. The highest risk patient and the highest risk patients would be all our patients with TIAs of stroke or diabetes, you bring it down to 2.0 millimoles. And in fact, our more recent um, uh, guidelines would indicate that 1.7 is better than uh, uh, 2.0. We use statins, we use high dose statins, and we frequently start with either rosuvastatin 40 milligrams or atorvastatin 80 milligrams, <clears throat> even in our elderly patients. The final segment is on antithrombotic medications. All our patients, this is our frontline aspirin, and we'll combine aspirin with clopidogrel in high risk patients. If they come in within the first 48 hours to uh, up to two to three days, the newer agent is tacagrelor. So aspirin plus tacagrelor is better than tacagrelor or aspirin alone. We have not had to date a comparison of aspirin plus uh, clopidogrel versus aspirin plus tacagrelor. And by the time uh, this presentation is in your list, by the time you're listening to it, the chance to data may be out, which compared these two. That's an exciting, important study. So lestazole may be used uh, in um, some of the countries uh, in the Middle East or the Far East. We don't have much experience with this in, in North America or, or in Europe. The place for NOAX the, or the, um, the direct oral anticoagulants is um, in patients with uh, underlying atrial fibrillation where warfarin is almost obsolete. So how do I see and how do I use these, these medications? So the, the dual antiplatelets is for the high risk patients that we've described. The single antiplatelets may be used for patients with low risk, non-consensus TIAs, I prefer aspirin to any of the other agents there. If the patient presents sometimes uh, after the first 48 hours. Uh, also, single agent is preferable in patients with large strokes. And if there's allergy to one of these two agents, if there's patient's allergy to aspirin, you may use clopidogrel or the other way around. We also consider using single uh, agent in patients who have recent bleed, who have asymptomatic disease, or if um, their duration of symptoms is more than seven days by the time they present to you. In all other patients, we prefer dual antiplatelet agents. As I end my presentation, um, remember that people are always scared about these high risk bleeding type situations. I can assure you that the risk of um, bleeding as it goes up, so as the risk of bleeding goes up, the risk of recurrent stroke goes up also. So even if there's high risk patients, you treat their underlying risk, even if you do a scope, uh, a gastroscopy in these patients, but antiplatelets are the most important way to prevent uh, a stroke in patients with TIA. So the final statement I have is that antithrombotic medications, the backbone of a robust prevention st strategy, use dual antiplatelets in high risk or minor stroke patients, single agents in all other patients. And very, very importantly, whenever somebody has symptoms on an antiplatelet agent, 
try not to switch the agents, try to emphasize that they take the medications. Uh, this whole business of failure uh, of, of um, agents is, is overrated. Don't forget that some of these patients, when they have events on um, anti platelet agents, may have underlying um, atrial fibrillation. So here's my strategy for you, and here's my summary for you. Um, I hope I've emphasized that a TIA is similar to acute coronary syndrome. There is urgency in managing these patients. You've got to promote vascular health. You've got to treat the hypertension aggressively as is the most important risk factor in our patients. You've got to treat their hyperlipidemia and if you forgot, treat their hypertension aggressively. I've given you the outline of antiplatelet agents. And I've also emphasized that you use anticoagulation for atrial fibrillation. And if you've got symptomatic, not asymptomatic, I should correct this, my apologies, in symptomatic patients, you would do a carotid endarterectomy or carotid stenting. I thank you for your attention and I look forward to questions uh, when this is presented at your meeting. Bye for now. Salaam